Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, good evening. My name is Julia Payton Jones and I'm director of the Serpentine Gallery. This is a very auspicious occasion because it is the first of our park nights, an evening where we celebrate a range of different things. But tonight we celebrate this pavilion designed by Smilian Radic, who is sitting next door to Hans Ulrich, uh, in the middle of... in the middle of this self-organized platform, and we've just been discussing how maybe in future we might be moved on a bit that way. Um, it's also an evening uh, where we're going to welcome Justin McQuirk, whose new book, Radical Cities, has just been published by Verso. I am a great uh, fan of reminding everybody about previous pavilions, so um, I've just been given the list, because even though I've worked on every single one of them, uh, I can sometimes go off message. The reason I want to remind you is because, and indeed remind myself, is because we're now in the 14th year of this commission, which has ranged from some of the greatest exponents in architecture today, who at the time of our, the, our invitation have not completed a, a building or a structure in England, to architects who perhaps are newer to the international context, um, but this incredible range is nevertheless the only scheme of its kind worldwide. So, in date order, starting from last year, Su Fujimoto, in 2012, Herzog de Murren and Ai Weiwei, in 11, Peter Zumptor, Jean Nouvel designed the pavilion in 2010, in 2009, Sana did a beautiful structure, 2008, Frank Geary, in 2007, Olafur Eliasson and Kirchl Torsen of the of the architectural practice in Oheta. Lila's was an installation by Zaha Hadid, which was a two-week um, kind of pop-up, I suppose you might say, in 2007. In 2006, Rem Koolhaas and Cecil Balmond with Arab designed the pavilion. In 2005, Alvaro Ziza and Eduardo Soto de Moura with Cecil Balmond. In 2003, the great modernist Oscar Nima. In 2002, Toyo Ito and Cecil Balmond with Arab. 2001, Daniel Liebskind with Arab, and in 2000, Zaha Hadid, who started everything. So, we are thinking about what we might do next year, our 15th anniversary, but it's too early to talk about that. What we do do is work with architects in the same way as we work with artists. And what that means, as maybe Smilian will touch on later, is encourage them to realize their vision, and also, we uh, set the bar quite high and embrace the fact that this structure doesn't need to have a lavatory or a kitchen. It is simply as it is. And this is an extraordinary um, freedom, we hope, for those people that we work with. For Smilian, who has an extraordinary reputation, um, he has principally focused his work in Chile, with commissions ranging from public buildings such as the Civic Neighborhoods in Concepcion, the Museo Chileno de Arte Precolombino in Santiago, the Restaurant Mestizo in Santiago, the Vic Winery in Milahue, and domestic buildings such as Copper House II, Talca, the Peter House in Papudo, and the House for Poem of the Right Angle. Vilches, to small and seemingly fragile buildings such as the extension to Charcoal Burner's House, Santa Rosa, and the wardrobe and mattress, one of two projects outside Chile in Tokyo, and the bus stop commission in Cumbranch, Austria. Smilian is part of a new generation of architects reinventing our relationship to the built environment. He moves across boundaries, and what's so interesting about this pavilion is the way that he's been described uh, in quite, oh, I hope I've got it here, uh, disparate ways. I think I may not have done, which is a pity, because it's very, very funny. No, I don't. But it's been described as an egg, as a donut, as a, um, something that has fallen from, from the sky, uh, as a futuristic structure, a huge number of uh, different kinds of titles that really uh, talk to... Oh, yes, here we go. Uh, 
a giant cocoon or a space-age spaceship, a head of a gigantic lumbering turtle, a delicate eggshell, a 60-ton pebble, or a giant donut, a Stone Age spaceship, a cocoon, a deformed donut, an extraterrestrial egg, and a Neolithic burial site. This is quite something for a structure that has only been viewed over the last three days. The English, as you know, take to their hearts very, very much anything that they can kind of make their own through naming it in a really colloquial way. So, Smillian, you've already been taken into the hearts of, of not only Londoners, but those who are further afield. Smillian is part of the Chilean miracle, and uh, it is one of the great fascinations to me that uh, Santiago has 40 different architecture schools. This is an extraordinary um, concept and one that I had the great privilege to get a little bit of a sense of when I came to Santiago to see you. We are incredibly indebted to you for your work here. It is something which I cannot describe to you the pleasure of working with architects on this project. It is a leap of faith from everybody's point of view, um, but particularly, I think, the architects. So I do thank you so much for in accepting the commission. Now wait. Hans Ulrich's going to come. <laughs> As Julia said, ladies and gentlemen, as Julia said, this is a wonderful occasion to celebrate Smilian Radic and uh, celebrate the book of Justin McCourt, to celebrate actually um, two very important things. We, I just wanted to say one thing which was very magical um, to add to what Julia said about the pavilion, because actually uh, the day, the first day when we just had finished installing everything, the first visitor we had was Su Fujimoto, who was the architect uh, who designed our last year's pavilion. Uh, and he wrote a wonderful tweet and Instagram for Smilian, which I just thought, welcoming you, I wanted to read. The future cave full of light. So quoting Su Fujimoto, we could say, welcome to our future cave full of light. Today is to celebrate Smilian, to celebrate the pavilion, uh, to celebrate, as Julia said, the Chilean miracle, this extraordinary architecture scene in Chile. But it's also to celebrate Latin American architecture at large. And that's why we want to celebrate radical cities across Latin America in search of new architecture by writer, critic, and curator Justin McGurk. It's one of the most extraordinary book of 2014, which Justin has uh, written. And we are very, very happy to later on hear from him more about how he sees the Chilean miracle within the context of the Latin American miracle of architecture and urbanism. Justin is director of the Strelka Press, the publishing arm of the Strelka Institute in Moscow. He's the design critic of The Guardian, the editor of Icon magazine, and also the design consultant to Domus. In 2012, he was awarded the Golden Lion at the Venice Architecture Biennale for an exhibition he curated with the Urban Think Tank. Traveling across Latin America in search of the architects, politicians, but also self-organized grassroots communities that are changing the landscape today, Justin has written this fascinating account which uh, takes us through many of these self-organized adventures. We're very, very grateful to him and also to his publisher, Verso Book, for this collaboration. And copies of Radical Cities are available in the Koenig bookshop, just inside the gallery's lobby. And I'm sure Justin will sign the book later after the presentation. With the conversation and the talk today, we launched a series of park night events. We hope you can come back, come back on many Fridays, Friday nights. We will have um, artist commissions, a new performance film by Hannah Perry, by uh, Hedda Philipson, her live audio sculpture, which is a response to the architecture of Smilian's Pavilion, and also Lina Lapelita's exploration with bass female voices. An evening of experimental sound with Harun Mirza, Mark Fell, and Ok Young Lee will play the pavilion as a musical instrument. And we then return to Chile with uh, an homage uh, to the Chilean filmmaker Raul Ruiz, uh, the great legendary Chilean filmmaker great filmmaker of the 20th century who died a few years ago, and we will have many of his actors and his producers like Melville Pupo and Paolo Branco here in the pavilion um, uh, reminding us of his work. We will have the sociologist Sigmund Baumann. So these are all the park nights which we um, will have here. Uh, it's now uh, um, the moment also to thank everybody who made possible um, the pavilion. And it's a very, very long list, so it would take an hour to read it uh, because it's a big collaboratorium. You will see it outside on our panel 
how many, many uh, people have actually made this possible, how many sponsors, how many supporters. Um, uh, I'd like to especially thank, of course, the Council of the Serpentine Gallery. Uh, without them, none of our work would be possible. Uh, and of course, our team, above all, our amazing, amazing team. Uh, Julie Bernal, who is a producer of Miracles and has, uh, uh, again, made the pavilion possible. Of course, many, many thanks to the amazing team, Jochen Falz, the head of programs, Lucia Pietro Justi, public programs curator, Claude Agil, assistant curator, Sarah Shattock, curatorial assistant, as well as the production team of Ian Pate and Kamel Akari. All of them are producers of Miracle, and we thank them very, very much. And please give now a very, very warm welcome to Smiljan Radic. start at the beginning. We're very curious. We, knew, we know a little more now, obviously, but maybe everybody in the audience um, might not be so aware about how you started in architecture. What, what made you think, this is what really I have to do? How, how did that come? How did that epiphany happen? Uh, well, my mom is here, and then <laughs> she could tell you something, but uh, I never, I never understand too much about architecture when I was on the school, just skiing and, and windsurf. That was my preoccupation. And then it's not really, and I said that it, because it was, was I, get, I get the school of architecture like a naive way, you know, I, because I draw a little bit really good. I mean, not really, but, but a lot. I, I draw a, a lot, but not so much. And always want to make something with the hands, but no more than them. In the, on the school, they, they make an exam at the, at the beginning when you have to go in. They asked me about Le Corbusier. I didn't know about Le Corbusier, and that was that was me my knowledge about it. Just absolutely ignorant about it, and that that's true. Man, that's true. I think for the average of the of the school of of the school of student in Chile at that time, the generation that we 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 called a miracle. You know? It's maybe coming from nothing, and could be I don't know how how can I explain, but is is that true? One uh, further question I want to ask before handing over. One of the things that is extraordinary about what you do is that you draw all the time. They're in the lobby of the Serpentine, there are some four beautiful drawings. And these are drawings that could be made by somebody who focused particularly on the visual arts as opposed to architecture. So this practice of um, drawing, as it were, for more in the vein of a visual artist as well as somebody who is obviously drawing to make structures, seem to exist very happily alongside each other. Why did you decide to go into architecture and not visual art? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I really don't know. I mean, uh, that's true. I mean, so it's more specific, you know? You have to be there, and you have to feel more. Um, architecture is more open, open, it's just an open profession. You could get from many places if you want. You have you have to be really powerful at the beginning, and I think it's it's more difficult to to take that decision when when you are really ignorant about about what's happening around you. That's it. It's it's coming later about about the art. Yeah. But I really don't know. I mean, it's not an option. I said, architecture, OK, let's go to study architecture. No more than this, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> now, the hand is very, very present in your work. And it's kind of interesting, because if you think about what we might lose in the digital age, you know, handwriting disappears, and also sort of sketching and doodling is less present, certainly, in architecture offices than it used to be with the computers. But that's not the case for you. You draw all the time, and the hand is very present. Can you tell us what sort of interests you so much about the hand, about drawing, painting, model? I, I, have, a, I have a really bad hand. But if you, uh, my, my, my movements are really stupid with my hands. I, have, I really don't have really good hands. The computer give me a really big instrument because it's more precise. You don't need a fine movement uh, about it. You, you just do it because everyone, every, every could do it, you know? But, but with the hands, I, I'm really, really 
bad. And when I do some models, are really bad models. And when my assistants do it, they, they are really afraid because I take it and I, I cut it and, and, and just destroy the models. And it's coming really beautiful things because it's appear many, many other things around it. And this is really funny. But I'm not have a, my assistant is Japanese, you know, my, my actual Japanese, he's really afraid about because always that I take the fine models that the, the that, and right now he's a, a little bit chilly, more, you know, <laughs> no, more, more freedom, you know. But at the beginning, he, he did, a, he made a really beautiful models. But when I, I come in and cut it and destroy it, he's really, um, that's understand about it. But I think destroying things, you, you could get things. And that is the problem with, the, for example, with the virtual or with um, three digital models, the physical ones, because you, you could not stop the process. You never could stop, stop the process. You always have to, to end the process um, to, to see the model and say, OK, it's good and it's not good. With the cartoons or paper or ceramic or anyone, you could stop the process and change and broken and it appear many other things. I think for that it's coming again the analog digital mo analog models because could, you could stop the process and that is really great, I think. I mean, it gives you a, a more possibilities in the, in the process. I mean, mm. I mean, we saw on this screen just before this drawing of yours, uh, one of the models and they are very, very beautiful and also very, very different. If you, when you go to your, your office, you, there are, um, they're kind of manageable in terms of size, but they're all from found objects. There's a feeling that um, in some way that they, they have their roots in something that you have seen or found or collected. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because it seems so specific about what your inspiration is in order to make architecture. Mm. The models are really, um, I think it's, it's, the same, it's the same sensation with the books. You know, when you have models around and you, when you have books around, you feel more comfortable. I don't know why. I don't know what's, what's his explanation, but it's really, in my, in my case, um, I made a lot of models, and my models always, I use part of this model to do another one. And that, and that gives you... Um, sometimes um, a continuity between the projects be because it's not about how repeat forms, it's about to take some solution for a specific problem that you could get it and put in another project, you know? Because I always wor work with the, this kind of collage way. Um, this collage could help you to resolve really easy, uh, um, really easy some problems that could be really difficult. For example, in the catalog that we, we will have Next ma next week, I think I think you will see a lot of drawings about how to enter in this space. How do you have? It's just one sketchbook about uh, the discussion. The discussion uh, in this sketchbooks is about how I must enter in this space because it's not really easy. Um, that's entries and entry. And with the models, it's more or less the same. You you have a solution and then you apply in another project and then always appear, sometimes appear really weird things, and that's beautiful. I mean, it's a new risk, a new, new, new kind of sensation about one solution in another context. It's, uh, it's really great. And then the analog way to do the things, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a freedom way to, when, you, when, when the models are not a fetish for you, you know? It's something that you could work. I do some models like a fetish because I like the fetish too, but it's uh, just in the last stage of the project sometimes. You know. Fetish, fetish is, uh, how do you say fetish? Fetish, fetish. yeah, I mean, uh, uh, joya, joya, fetish, fetish, fetish sorry. Fetish, fetish. <laughs> fetish, yes, fetish. Yes. <laughs> fetish. Thank you. Very much. So you mentioned the collage, and, and, and kind of the collage brings us to what the late Peter Smith and the wonderful uh, English architect always called the as found and how you bring as found things into your collages. And that's already present in your early fragile constructions where you use leftover material, where you use the countryside. I mean, your very first project, you bring in earth. And then quite soon also in the Chilean house, other natural elements. You famously use, of course, the rocks which you use here. So I was wondering if you can talk a little bit about that aspect of, because also this pavilion is of course a collage and how you bring the real into the work and, 
and use found objects. Um, when, when I came, but when I finished the school at, at, in, uh, in Chile was uh, in the 90s, was, I, I don't, I, I'm not confused, but I read uh, a book, really beautiful, and they call um, De la Metropolis a la Vanguardia. The, they, this book coming from the um, School of Architecture in Venice, and they said, and all of the people who wrote there, they 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 they, they teach they they teach uh, there in in this in that school, and they said, uh, let's go to study to study um, history there, history of architecture, because in my school they they didn't. Uh, they didn't um, teach me anything about about the the history, and then sometimes the history is really dangerous for for some people, and then they don't they doesn't take the take the real history about it. But when I returned back to Chile, I said, oh, I, I would like to some friend of mine come in Chile, and I began to made a guide, a touristic guide, and I take a, I try to to understand how they could understand about Chile, and I, I began to collect this fragile construction that I call later fragile, con fragile constructions. Um, that constructions mean some people is, on, is on, on the road and take many other elements and build a cell a a um, room for sell cheese, uh, cheese or sell fruits or anything or sometimes they made a small crypt, or sometimes they, they made a house or a tent, or, no, you know, but the, the beautiful of that, of that fragile construction that, take, that they have on, on his around, I mean, they take uh, the things that uh, they have around them. And that is really beautiful because it gives you the possibility to have really freedom to take things and put together. And, and it's an attitude more than a, more than a formal mechanism. It's an attitude to say to feel really free. Free if you have this this floor, you could put it. If you but at the end, the 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 total you have to be really conscious if you are architect about the total of this mechanism, formal mechanism. But they they do it in a naive way. I am not a naive. I have I am an architect. I have to think about it. But it was a really challenge to see that buildings and that and 20 years ago because give me um, the the way to think in architecture without, um, without do the same things, everything. And then for that, if you see my books or my monograph, always you could feel the, each, part, each um, project could be do it for one different architect. Maybe it's for that base far away on the time right now. I mean, no? When, I was, um, when I was in Santiago, I was much struck um, by the regularity with which I saw David Hockney etchings on the desks of architects. And I found this fascinating because they, it was so totally unexpected. Uh, and indeed, you reference Hockney and those etchings in, um, quite often in your work. What is it about them that inspires you so much? Is it the stories, or is it the, the etchings themselves? Or it's both? A, it's a, um, both. I mean, I mean, in that series of David Hogden, he works um, uh, really experimental. The, he, he was learning, I, I suppose, about the prints, and they, they use a lot of different kind of uh, printing um, way to, to do, how they say, how, um, different way to do a print. And, 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 and that's that's one thing, and the other things. This special history um, in Italian is El Capretto di Mare. I, I, I really don't know in English how it's the sea where or something like this is the the, the history of uh, David Hockney. Um, there is a beautiful history, long one, uh, about a princess that don't want to get married, and then every guy who came to her. He, he, he killed them, okay? And the princess is on, on the top of a tower with 12 glasses, windows really, one of them, one of each them is really more clear. And she could uh, see 
more far away of each one of them. I mean, she could really far away, and then nobody could get her, you know? And then this guy asked her to, to do in three ways, because, and she said, okay, because she's so handsome. And she said, okay, you have three opportunities to do it. And one time is he, she, he hid in, in a fish. The second one, he hid in, in, a, in an egg. And the, second, and the third one, he made a, um, how do you say, un truco, uh, a, trick. a trick to, to, get, to get married with the, when the, uh, with the trick. He got it, you know, he got the head. But the, the beautiful things, I think, you have a really tower, really, uh, how do you say, really, um, um, you know, contemporary architecture, because it's really transparent. You could see everything. It's uh, like a, you could see everything. And for the other side, you have a refuge. And that was my, my, my problem. My problem is with the refuge. What's in the refuge in the contemporary architecture? And this boy, if you see the, the boy hidden in a fish or the boy hidden in, in, a, in an egg, always you have uh, in between a transference. Uh, when you see the, the egg, you see just a transference, but with the boy in the middle or, and the fish is more or less the same uh, in the Hogney's prints. And it's really beautiful because you have this this is strange feeling with the reality that, that with the strange feeling that you could be really in yourself, but at the same time expose it. And that, that is a, a fight that, I, in my case, I, I really want to do it in the, in the architecture. But it's just a feeling about the, the connection with the landscape and with the, with the neighborhoods and with the people, you know? And this pavilion is more or less it's, it's reflect, reflecting about this, because if you see from the street, for example, you see a really opaque volume, really, really interior space, you know? But if you go inside, you, you see this, this, this masking table all around you. Um, you feel the translucent, but at the same time, you feel the different way to see the different landscape there, more domestic space there, the grass, the ceiling, this, the sky, and the, other, and the gallery from the other side. And then you have this, this different way to understand the same problem, but uh, still there, still on the, on the boy hidden in the fish and boy hidden in, the, in an egg. That was uh, an, an, an uh, installation, the boy hidden in a, in a fish. When I, we began with this, with, was with Marcela Correa, an installation at the Biennale uh, 2010, with, when Sejima asked, asked us to do something there, and was really, in that time, I mean, four years ago, beginning really, really, I really understand what, what I would like to do it with that kind of sensations. I mean. But it's exciting mm. because actually mm. I want to no, say no, something. Please. No, no, please. I want to say something which I find, I found fascinating in when I first saw the model and during our discussions, and I find it as fascinating now. I think of this pavilion as being incredibly romantic. Mm. And it's romantic because in spite of the, the quality of the surfaces, particularly the egg surface, this surface. You can look down onto the, through the hole there and you can call across and there's something which is a very particular relationship that has certainly never existed in any other pavilion. On the one hand, it's very intimate and it, uh, I think we referred to it at the time as the Romeo and Juliet effect. Mm -hmm. But there's some, also, in addition to that, so much of your architecture has this kind of backbone to it, mm -hmm. this kind of central space. So the open space there, the well, also relates to, to that. Mm -hmm. Why is it that you have a backbone, perhaps, that is a kind of roots your structures, your, your, your structures to the uh, earth? There are two things there. Uh, it's, so, it's so funny. But you know, this, this is coming from other, other, other um, the, 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 the model who is the beginning of it. Is there some pictures about, is the model that we call the John Selfish Castle. It's about Oscar Wilde uh, history. It's uh, really beautiful because in that case, the John is coming, the John Selfish is coming to home after seven years talking with his friend, an Ogro. How do you say Ogro? Uh, Ogro. 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 Seven years talking with him, and he's so tired and coming to, to his castle and found many, many children around. And I had no more cry, no more uh, gritos. How do you say? Chats so and no more. Please go ahead, and it's really natural, you know. It's really uh, an attitude. It's really natural. And then he said, "But for that, 
the winter is coming and the, the weather is destroyed the castle, you know? Um, the, the, I do a model it's like this, really like this, in papier mache and Burda patterns. Um, and it's so funny because I made a wheel, and then I made a wheel, I made this volume, and this have this patio. This patio is, is just the John Castle Gardens, you know, inside. But at the end, it was uh, um, unweathered, and, and it was destroyed. And it's, it's something when, I was, when I, we are discussing about how to enter in this, in this pavilion, was coming this, this pushing by you and Hans. It's coming this, again, this, this model because because it's the way to get in a wheel. It's really difficult to get inside in architecture. It's really difficult to go in because you have to compose. To me, compose something is really, it's, it's really hard to think it about. And then it, we made this cutted. Is the cutted that really, really near from the cutted that you could find in the model that made in my destroyed uh, hands. You know, I, I destroyed the, the, and then you have these runes, these new runes. It's new runes about the John Selfish Castle. This, I mean, and this is this is about in the mix, in the middle, because the the texture at the end is more like, like a masking tape. It's coming the boy hidden in the neck, but the the form and the shapes it's coming more or less than the John Selfish Castle. It's a it's a real in, in the mix. I mean. It's mm. wonderful about David Hockney because David Hockney often visits uh, our pavilion. They actually made an incredible digital painting of the Zumthor pavilion, you mm -hmm. know, the cloister type with the garden. So we can look forward that he hopefully, you know, will visit your pavilion also this summer. And uh, besides Hockney, I was also thinking about Joseph Beuys, you know, because thinking about the uh, uh, basalt stone installations and this sort of end of the century piece where he sort of out of those stones lets new life grow. And uh, looking at the lecture from you the other day online uh, in Spanish, it's a very old lecture you gave, I think, in 2009 in Barcelona. You started a lecture with the image from Boyce. It wasn't stone. I think it was felt mm. there. And so I was curious, because we talked about Hockney, but to hear a little bit more about Joseph Boyce and to which extent he's an uh, inspiration. Boys for me, it's about it's about um, textures. It's about heavy, heavy materials. It's about um, um, free. Three artists around these heavy, heavy metals. We, you know, um, felpa. How do you say felpa? It's um, felt, 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 and and, and stones. And um, um, the beautiful things of, for for example, for the felt is that they he used like a primitive material, and that is so funny because it's so. It's so something that is right now is so fashion. In 30 years ago, it was really heavy and and really really strong and really you know like a constructive material. Um, that is uh, that is lost right now. And, but we 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 made a. a, a um, uh, this piano. I don't remember the name of the of the of the work. It's a piano uh, involved. Um, Covered by, by felt, but if you, bumpy, yeah, 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 and you feel you feel really, really, really soft the surface, but at the same at the same time you feel the sound is in the interval. You know, you have a again, a, a, I feel a small refuge inside. You have you have to cover. You have to you have to how do you say uh, protect an interval and some really interval sounds really shut sound and sil silence silence sounds inside and that gave me a sensation of peace and um, friendly place and friendly object inside and that that was i really don't know too much about both but that's that that is my feeling about that kind of works I mean so if we return to specifically to this project to this commission what were the challenges that you faced when you were designing, when we commissioned you, when we were working together on it? What, what, what did it feel like to do this project? Marvellous, obviously. Stressed. <laughs> Stressed. <laughs> Stressed. Indeed. Stressed. That's For the all beginning. of us, that's by the, the way. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know, uh, this, this place is uh, the problem of it, the problem of this place that it's really, it's really public. This position of this of this place is really massive, but at the same time, it's it's getting and I understand right now really good. I understand that it's really symbolic, 
for the city, for the architectures. Um, it's, a, it's a place to discuss about architect, architecture. And it's getting, it's getting each, each year, it's getting more strong because you are really, really do it and history about it. And you could, and you, everybody, right now, everybody, um, how do you say, uh, as, uh, espera, uh, wait for, not for the next pavilion, for the next sense of the parliament, you know, wh where, what, what, what they going to choose right now, you know, that's, that is funny because it's a, it's a really, it's a really way to think about architecture at the beginning, before the pavilion, you know, and that is really the, the curatory and the, and the director of this and at the same time, because it's not about the landscape. This park is really beautiful all around it. It's not, a, when, when I was with you uh, the first time, I, I remember we are walking there. You say, oh, that is a piece of grass. You know, yeah, <laughs> that, that's a piece of grass, but you know, and when the pavilion is not here, the piece of grass is really small, you know, and you don't know how they, you could put the, uh, and, I don't know, 300 square meters inside it. You, you say, it's, it's gone because before I never been there in one other pavilion. This was my first visit to a, a pavilion, and that that is really funny. I mean, because I was not referenced about the scale, about the size, about anything, and that give me more. You know, you you are. I really and I at the beginning I I have to say that I don't I really I don't understand how important is this place for, for, for everyone, you know? And, and it's really important to say that, it, that it's, it is not possible if you don't have a really big team on your back because two months or six months to do everything, it's, it's impossible. I mean, it's not, it's not true. And if you, if you find any mistake around it, it's about, it's, it's, it, that talk about 14 weeks to do everything, you know? And that is really powerful. Powerful about uh, Tom, David, Julie, Emma, uh, Johan, and you, you, uh, me, and Julie. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a big, it's a big problem. It's a big problem. And then, and, and for me, it's. But when the process is coming, you feel that that you you have company, and then will be possible. I mean, yeah, I think so. But was it stressful? <laughs> the only thing I can say about that is it's a stressful for everybody. So, yeah. I mean, you know, that's not great, but, um, but it is a fascinating thing. And I, I think it's interesting that the Serpentine model is a model which not only bases itself on curatorial conventions, we work with architects in the same way as we do with artists, um, and therefore the time scale is very tight, but it's also about making something happen and against the way that architecture normally happens, which is durational. You know, if you have six months, you have yeah, six yeah, months. Yeah. And the option is either to do it or not to do it. Yeah. And, and that always remains throughout the project as an option not to do it. Yeah. It's also interesting, this idea, you know, this, you describe it as a, a problem because that has a lot to do with your work in general that you, you know, develop out of such problems or challenges or questions. It's not, you don't have a, a given form which you then apply or repeat, you never repeat. And I remember we met each other for the first time in uh, Venice at that Shinohara, uh, at that um, Sejima uh, Biennale. And in the Sejima Biennale, when Julia and I met you, we talked about Shinohara, the wonderful Japanese architect, the late Shinohara, who made these amazing houses, very complex houses. And he told us that you love that Shinohara advanced case by case, so there is a problem, and then uh, each, it leads, each problem leads to a completely diverse solution. And so he would never have you know, a language of forms which he would apply, it's the opposite. And maybe it's interesting that you tell us a little bit about this methodology of yours, about Shinohara, and how you, know, you solve that problem here, step yeah. by step. You know, but, but the problem if you, if you I, I, if if I not do it in that way, you you get bored. You know, you get bored about the how do we do it? Because if I always the people say it's so funny because why you are here? But I, I really don't know. You must ask you Hans and Julian. You know, that's that's not my problem. I'm I'm here, and then uh, but but at the end at the end of this is the depend uh, that's. Maybe one 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 thing is that that that, that I could not try to repeat anything. But right now I have some family, some 
families of pride that guy could change and could move around it but but it's about Shinohara Shinohara was a really powerful powerful architect not just for the things that they do that's it was really powerful it's his character and his way to think the things and he was really but he always think about radicals and i love the 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 radicals architecture, this, which is coming from 50s to end of the uh, to the beginning of 70s, so all of there is a second layer of architects that are really, really radicals in that time. And Shinohara, I think, I suppose, because I really don't know so much about the Japanese architecture history, but but I suppose it was really, really radical because he never he never felt um, conform. How do you say? Conform with with his result, you know. He he ever discuss about how to do it again and how to do it in another way, and that is really beautiful to to not get boring and to get the life more free and more simple, you know. And that's that's it, I think. I have to ask about Open City, um, a place that I visited when I came to see you, um, which is just such an extraordinary project. Um, maybe you could just explain to everybody what Open City is, and also with that incredible reference point, I imagine, for any architect working in Chile, what, whether it influenced you in any way, or whether it was something that you recognized and sidestepped. Um, maybe my father said that he was really angry if I will be, will be first that I born, you know? He said to my mother, he said, you, you must not be architect, yeah, and you must not be priest. That's, that's, that's uh, the, you know, both things, both things. And I think he, he said that because he knows some architects of, of the School of Architects of, of Valparaiso, you know, <laughs> the, the School of Architects of Open City, because it's really weird. Uh, we are a school of architecture, really, really strange for, for everyone. And it's still, it's still there, but it's, they are so beautiful because they made really, really fragile construction, we could say that. Not, not, not in, that, in that sense, but be really unweathering. And they use really poor materials because they don't have money, but they made a, a large and really complex egg structure with spatial, Act, space uh, structures uh, without nothing, without anything, and that is really beautiful. And I think that the most, for me, the most important was uh, an architect which was is called Miguel Aikem. Um, he has a small house in the in, in just near to Santiago with a, with some um, caves. It's like like a cave. It, he has some bovedas, how this um, bolts. Of of 20 millimeters like this of concrete, you could say it's uh, it could be like this and bolt like this and really really fragile. But if you are there, you feel really beautiful. We made we print a book about this this um, this uh, house, but it was the book was uh, about about not the architecture. It was about the um, it was about the soft. I mean the objects inside of the architecture. And we made a lot of plans of an isometric with all of the objects. And it was really hard. It was there a friend of us uh, for two months drawing in a computer because the owner was um, uh, entomologist. Entomologo, uh, the entomology, the people about insects, you know. And they have a lot of small boxes on the house, and they, but huge spaces, a really beautiful collections about. And then if you see these plants, you could fill the house, but without the structure of the house. And then that is for say the, this space has changed a lot with people and a lot without people. And then and then but the the more or less the the, the, the architect have to have this kind of relation with the fragile, with the used and everything. And and this guy it's really it's, I think it's his 90 years old right now, or something like this. He's really smart, and he he the open city, the best of the open city. I say I, I could say it, um, they they know how to build. 
they really know with really poor and really um, poor materials, but more than poor materials, poor, uh, um, uh, really simple way to do it. But at the end, you got it a really complex. The joints are really simple, but the, 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 the total are really, really complex. I mean, for those of you not been there, it is, it is really like a collage. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's a combination of Frank Gehry and Mad Max kind of yeah. mushed together. And also the feeling is absolutely as though it's organic. So you start at one point, and it's not a consideration of the form in its entirety, but it's something that grows in the way that is dictated by the process in some kind of interesting way. Um, would you say that you're process-driven as an architect? Because in your office, there's almost no sign of technology, which is very, very refreshing. Um, it feels that it's all by the hand, as we described. So how, how would you describe that? How would you describe your work in relation to Open City? You know, sometimes the, the people make some, uh, how do you say, relations in between Open City and my work or the people who work there in my work because they, because the literature. But in that way, the literature for the open city is something on the basis, something like a Bible, you know? It's they, they, they start with, the, with some poem and arrive to the building. I don't know how, but they do it. I mean, maybe they, they are not in connection, but it's not my problem. But they, they build something and they have a poem. You know, they, in between, I don't know what's happened and in between. I use the literature, but for me, literature on, on this architect doesn't have to any 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 things to get, they, they, they don't have a, a commonplace, you know? I really separated in, in between. I, I have literature and I have architecture. Maybe on some of these projects with the models, I apply some, um, a mechanism, a formal mechanism that they call ex phrasis, that is, is, is for example, to, to do some, is to, to get a visual of something that is just on the literature. For example, the, the typical example is the Salomon Temple or the or the or Torre de Babel. You know that kind of example that you you have uh, some illustration about. Um, my 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 way my my I try to do the same with the David Hockney uh, with the David Hockney uh, prints. Try to get in three three dimensional. For, um, three dimensions, uh, something that is just on the flat plane, and and that's are the the relation be, with literature, but but it's not in the same way. And then uh, and then right now they they, they are really um, and the other things it could be a, a a little bit connections. It's about they are really a handmade process in here in his architecture. Um, in their architecture. In here, for example, it's, I was really afraid and, and at the beginning, and you know it's about the, the England architecture is really precise. It's really shining and polished, and you know, it's, um, and I never thought about have to really good feedback. I mean, not I thought it, it will be a really good, good feedback, but I, I really don't know how will be that feedback from the, with the normal public, you know? And uh, I think it's so funny to see the people touching and to people feeling, oh, looks like masking tape, looks like, um, and when I came in from the first time uh, four, years, four, four days ago, I feel inside of uh, one of these models that was the John Selfridge Castle, and, and that was great. I mean, the builders was really, really great about it because I feel, I, I feel at home, you know? It's, that's funny. That's fun. because that's funny because the police and your commission talk about this to get some foreign experience to come in London to show something, you know, and that is really important. I mean, it was a really good curator in that way too. That mm. could almost be a wonderful conclusion. I've had, got one very last question, which is I've been thinking the whole evening, you know, sitting here about air, uh, and somehow there is an amazing kind of you know presence of air in this in this pavilion. Uh, obviously, open city has a lot to do with air. It's an amazing sight that the sea, the breeze plays a big role in Ritoke in this, you know, in this site. Um, Shinohara, whom you mentioned, always told me 
in my sort of last meeting with him about the importance of air in architecture. The late Cedric Price, the visionary English architect, in his last project said for Manhattan, you know, there shouldn't be any more buildings in Manhattan. One should just inject air into Manhattan and have, a, you know, an oxygen, yeah, a, a zone without building. Yeah. Uh, and when Julia and I, you know, spoke to you in the preparation, uh, actually, for the, for the catalog, uh, together with Jochen Waltz, um, in, in one of these conversations, you mentioned air almost being an important medium for you, air being as important as the other you know, materials we spoke about, as important as the, the, the materials, the structures is built. You said air, uh, actually, um, that you never wanted air to be trapped. So I was kind of wondering that maybe we could talk a little bit about air. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's so funny because I always, we, we, when we saw some pictures of architecture, we always looks a flat surface of uh, really always looks really great, you know? We, we never expose a bad picture. It's, you have to be really stupid to show a bad, bad, uh, bad picture of architecture, man. But at the end, at the end, the most be beautiful thing is the atmosphere that you have in a, in a space. And that is, that is not about pictures, it's about to go to the place. So you could not do it. In my, in my experience, the most beautiful place that I have been in my life was the Palace of Congress uh, of Tang de Gaulle by Le Corbusier. It was a really beautiful place, and the whole is better than the, than the big, because you have a black floor, a black ceiling, and you have in, in a darkness inside, and you have a really huge columns on a field that you are in a, you know, you, you feel it could be, it could be there. It could be, could be be there. Any events there, and you could feel re in this shadow, uh, you you could feel really really good. Um, and the other place that I I I it was in the uh, how do they say the museum of Nishizawa in the um, Tashima, um, Naoshima, the the on the, the last island. In the, on the island. Um, the the bubble is a is a water water. Oh, I don't know, remember the name. It was in Tashima. But it's that, in that space of Nishizawa is absolutely brilliant. Um, in that space, you could feel, if you are inside, um, you could feel on weathering. You are inside, and you could feel the air going through this pavilion, and going through this pavilion, and you could feel the real, when, when we was there, four years ago in 2010 was really funny because you could feel the birds outside, but the sound of the, of the birds coming inside, and you feel outside, inside. That was really beautiful, and, uh, and the sky is, the, the light is really lightness, um, fragile, and um, white. It's a really beautiful, and you could not talk about the surface. You just talk about the air. What's happened in the space? Not uh, about that. That uh, about and, and that is really. And in my last project was uh, I made a, a really big uh, room, big for Chile. You know, it's a really big room uh, for some museum, and I do just a darkness room for to show a little small pieces of Chilean, pre-Columbian Chilean uh, works. And, and the darkness is some of the, the way to really um, qualify the air or how you, you could trap air in that condition. It's really, really difficult. And that was great, because if you get in and you could, you, you could not feel underground, you could feel in a space that you have a lot of space all around you, but you could you just see the pieces, and you feel really good in the in the in the, in the place. That it's a friendly space, but it's not. But it's a really darkness. It's a really shadow, and that is coming from the again the Japanese culture. The, the, that is that, that that was one of the 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 you know elogio de la sombra. That uh, how do you say? Uh, uh, yeah, the of, of Tanisaki, that kind of things. But trap air means means to get more volume, get more volume, but volume with some uh, qualities that you could not. Aldo Rossi talked the same about this in the in the Francesco Di Giorgio Amantova, Sant'Andrea Amantova, talked the same when the cloud is coming into the 
into the gates, you know, and coming into the gates and, and, and the clouds, and he, filled in, he felt inside like a, in a field, in the middle of the field, but it's in the middle of a church. And that kind of sensation, it's really beautiful, I think. It's, uh, if, if, if you can do it, it will be, could be great, I think. That's it. Mm. Well, may I suggest we have um, time for three questions? Um, we need to have a microphone. Um, and I wonder who would like to be the first person to ask a question. Um, what was your initial starting point for the structure? Never there is one. There is a lot of them. I mean, you, you, I mean, it's so funny because when you see the pavilion, it's, that's it, a uh, pavilion. You go and go and run, but it's, in a short time, you have, many, many, you, have to, you have to work with many possibilities. I understand when I... I I, I, I bring my, fir my first sketch, I said, okay, let's go to travel, to work with a lot of possibilities because you could not, you could not do it in one line because you could lost in, in some time, you know? And, and then to, to manage many possibilities more flexible and give you, but always in the same, in the same line, you know? Uh, you always, we're always working about, about in, in the same line, I mean, with, this, with the same atmosphere or sensation on behind, not, 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 not trying to produce any, 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 any project, any different atmosphere. The atmosphere was, will be, was, was be this, always the same, but the shape is changed, the, the, some elements inside change, and everything and change a lot, I mean, because the cost, because, because the client, because the, you know, because and, and because because there have to be people inside, because the rain, because we hope not, etc., etc. <laughs> et Another question over there. Can you tell us what is your uh, project, which is unrealized, but you definitely want to have it realized? You you know my 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 clients in general are really weird. Some of them are here. You know, <laughs> two of two of them. You know. Then when, when they come into me, they are sometimes, not sometimes, almost, they are really sure they, they want to build. And I'm not projecting something like a career, you know, it doesn't matter. I mean, the, the architects mean possibilities. If you have some possibilities around you, you got it. But it's not about think how, I'm, for example, I'm not care about the scale, about not care about the size. I, I don't feel really confident in a big scale. I mean, that's, that's it. I mean, Shinohara have that problem too. It's, it's really, he made, he did houses, you know, he projected almost at then. And then I really, I could not say if I would like to, to build something. Right now we are made in housing in Chile middle class, you know, and I'm really, really, really enthusiastic about that. I'm, I'm really, I could not say anything, but I mean. Mm -hmm. Eddie, yes, one last question. Hello. How do you think this conceptual architecture can translate into practical architecture? For example, there are 50 million displaced people in the world who need housing. You've talked about housing. How do you think this idea could be translated in a practical way? I think it is practical. I mean, I, mean, I, I, don't, I, don't, I really don't think, I mean, you know, it's really confused when, when my, there are a lot of architects that could talk about the problem of the world and then do it a house. It's not my business. I mean, I could not do it, I could not speak about the problem of the world because I'm really ignorant about this, I'm worried about that, but I'm, I could not do it a lecture about this. I mean, it's not, it's not I could not do it, really. Don't, don't, it's, I'm really honest about it. I mean, I don't know if, uh, and then about your question, I could say, I don't know. I really don't know about it. Because I, I, I really, I know that, that there are really huge person that they are thinking about. It. And I'm not care about that kind of, I I'm care about like a citizen, like like of that problem, but maybe not that, not like architect. Maybe it could be sometimes if I have the possibilities. But right now, it's not my. It's not. I could not do it. You know, I could not thinking about it because I just do it case by case by case. By case okay, and then and then the answer is uh, I don't. I really don't know. Mm -hmm. 
million. Thank you very much, William.